iCloud. It's live on Facebook right now. We are live on Twitter. Three, two, one. I feel like Joe Rogan. Three, two, one. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome. Pete Caliendo here, Baseball Outside the Box. Hey, we, we always tell you it's the show that loves the challenge of status quo, but we got two guys on the show today that definitely challenge the status quo. They have done that all their lives, and that's why they're two of the best in the world. Let me introduce two of our guests today. We're going to go into the brain. The brain, it starts in the, with the brain, and it ends with the brain. That's what they've told me. So Jeff Crushell, Crush Performance, MLB International Coach, he goes all over the world setting up the athletic development programs for MLB, and he's also a former MLB strength and conditioning coach with the Toronto Blue Jays. First of all, Baseball Canada, great program, and don't forget Canada Day and Fourth of July for the United States. We both had, you know, had that recently, so God bless everybody there. Our second guest, Tim Nicely, 27 years, he has studied the brain. I I couldn't study it for five minutes. He studied for 27 years. Unbelievable. He's the president of VFlex Technology, the author of Turn Your Brain On. That's what I need more of. And he it took him just to write this book, 15 years of research, three years to write the book. Tell me he doesn't know something about the brain. So let me welcome first my good friend from Crush Performance, one of the best podcasts in the business, Jeff Crochelle. What's up, buddy? Hey, Pete. Thanks for having me, man. Good to see you. Happy... Uh... A uh, belated Fourth of July to everybody down there. Thank you, and I I got my Canada stuff on. You didn't? I don't know if you noticed that. I noticed it right off the top, man. 1999 Junior Elite Camp, love it. And base build BC Baseball, one of the best organizations. You you and I have been over 45, 50, who knows how many countries. This is one of the best organizations, baseball youth organizations, and that I've been around, um, especially at the grassroots level, man. They do a great job. So a they little do. shout out to them. Absolutely, they do a great job, Mike. Yeah, and Mike Kelly and the boys over there um, have really, really got a, a great organization going. Absolutely. Tim, how you doing, buddy? Hey, doing great, Pete, man. Thanks for having me on today. I'm looking forward to it. And you're, are you in Tennessee or are you traveling? I'm down in Tennessee today. I was in California a week ago, I guess, out at uh, Titleist Performance Institute and uh, made my way back, got myself tested for COVID, and I'm negative. That, that, oh. Fantastic. And I noticed you got your patents. It sounds like for golf, I don't know, football, all sports. How many sports? And 30 minutes ago, UPS showed up at my door, brought my first uh, implicit piece for golf, man, from my manufacturer. And I'm, I really, I don't, I don't know if I can stay in the seat today, to be honest <laughs> with you. Well, you know, it'll with the, everything that's going first, on, that's great news. It's great news. I mean, it, it's in a, in a, in a sport that uh, maybe a little bit more receptive than baseball and softball have been, you know, it's an individual sport and uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm super excited. I hope I've got four patents now in golf and uh, I'm excited. You know, I'm I meant to, to ask take my time. And, and I meant to ask you because, and this is how we're going to kind of lead in. First of all, we're going to talk about, I want you to talk about your story, how you even got into studying the brain. Um, and then, I want you to cover a little bit for some coaches. We're going to have coaches out there like myself. We're looking at implicit, explicit. Make sure we explain what that is. But what's interesting, too, is um, golf has not been training implicitly because I noticed that that's new to them. Normally, golf's the leader in, uh, in these areas. Yeah, and, you know, I'm, not, I'm, I'm no golfer. So uh, I'm just providing tools for these coaches to, to utilize. And... Uh, all these professional golfers, the, the guys that train professional golfers, they, they have a very unique take on my stuff. When they see my stuff, it's unique to them. It's very novel. It's, it, they always ask, how did you come up with that? Or, you know, how did you, how'd you figure that out? And I say, uh, true epiphanies. You know, when you get something that nobody else has ever seen before, normally you don't work your way into that. You, you wake up in the middle of the night and there it is. I mean, it just, your, your brain has been working overtime behind your back trying to figure it out. Maybe, and maybe one day you have that epiphany on something you've been working on. How, and, how uh, did you get started in studying the brain? Well, uh, my cousin, I, I was building the Tennessee Smokies baseball stadium. Uh, I had a truss package to set the trusses on the stadium. 
and uh, one of my cousins, uh, a girl, uh, fell 21 feet head first onto the concourse there. As, as you enter the stadium, we were on our last truss. We had set a mile of trusses and she hit head first and had a massive brain injury. And uh, she took a breath every 54 seconds. Blood was coming out both of her ears and uh, the medevac helicopter landed in about 22 minutes. So I, I actually watched her take 22 last breaths. You know, I thought she was gonna die in my arms, but she didn't, she made it nine days in a deep coma, 145 on life support, and then uh, seven years in, a, in multiple stages of coma. And uh, that's what sparked my curiosity. I had been teaching psychology at the local high school, and I knew a lot about the mind and how the mind worked and all this mental game and all this stuff. I'd coached baseball, played college baseball, and heard all this mental stuff my whole life. But when you have a brain injury, that's not a mental injury. Uh, it's purely neurological. And so she lost sight in her left eye and uh, she can't taste and she can't smell. And she didn't have a tongue injury or a nose injury or an eye injury. She had a brain injury. So uh, 20 some odd years ago, I started studying the brain. I wanted to know how to wake her from her coma because she was just going to lay there for the rest of her life, if it was 20 years or 30 years or whatever it might have been, it, it turned out to be seven. And uh, man, all, all I've done is read the Bible and, and read brain research and try to apply it, you know, for the last so many years. But uh, once I understood how the brain wanted its information, how it was trying to wake itself up, you know, because it, it's a conserver of energy. You know, uh, if your phone could save energy like your brain, you could charge it once a year. One time a year would get enough charge in your phone, which told me that the brain really was a lazy organ, that it likes to shut itself off. And it shuts programs off all the time, instantaneously. And therefore, uh, <laughs> you know, when you're standing in the batter's box, you want to know if your brain is on or if your brain is off. How do you make that brain engaged? Therefore, I wrote the book called Turn Your Brain On because your brain just won't come on because you're talking to it. It's a self-aware organ and uh, it knows itself. It named all of your other organs. It names your pets and your children. It, it's a really unique organ. And uh, to rationalize with it, you better be able to speak in a little bit in an electrical language. So that's a little bit of the history behind mm -hmm. V-Flex. Man, I didn't start out trying to develop golf tools or baseball, softball tools or anything like that. I, I really wanted, and there was a great need for me to try and wake my cousin from a coma. Although nature eventually woke her up, you know, it took time, seven years, but I watched her brain rebuild itself. I watched her brain learn how to cry. I watched her brain learn how uh, to do other things and become an emotional person again, you know, tie into pain and anger and fear and depression and all of those mental things that we talk about. But she had none of that until her brain became a healthier brain. And the, the exercises that we do in batting practice or on the golf field or in shooting a basketball or a hockey puck, anything that we do, we're going to make sure those neurons are actually active during that time. And uh, that's what we do, you know, here at V-Flags. Cross, you've talked about this on your show many times, the new frontier. Um, add to how, how you see this picture of the brain how and how coaches are going to get into actually understanding it what's the where do we start yeah this is a great one and tim's story is just inspiring to me you know they say necessity is the mother of invention um that is just a great great example of exactly that and you know when i first met tim um it was uh, a really really great union of of information so that was a few years ago tim and i met and and it's been interesting he opened my eyes to a bunch of things and we had some great conversations and you know, these types of conversations get you thinking. So right now, guys, you know, where I'm, where we're at, and Tim, we could just talk about Tim's discussion right there for the next two hours. You know, the brain is such an incredible organ. And, and you know, the way we 
try to talk to some of our athletes to sort of frame it up and even some of our coaches to frame it up so they can understand it. You know, if you think about it, Abraham Lincoln said years ago, you know, if you had six hours to chop down a tree, spend the first four sharpening the ax. You probably all heard that one before, but man, are those words of wisdom right now. And if we're really going to take a look at the long-term develop development of an athlete, the brain is sort of like the mission control for everything that goes on, as Tim mentioned. The body is simply the tool the brain's going to use to get your task done. And so, and so if, if you can, of course, train the body is important because there's very, very, uh, it's a very, very complex system. Um, the, the body responds ingeniously to its environment, but only based on the information that goes into and comes out of the brain. And so when, when these two things come together and you start understanding, especially in the framework of progressive development and long-term development of an athlete, when we get to the point of really maximizing brain development alongside of physical development, human performance is going to go to new levels. And we're on the precipice of that right now. We're right on the frontier edge of that right now. So if you think about it, on the physical side of training, we're kind of at a biological ceiling, we like to say. You know, if you want to get faster, higher, stronger, we can do that. We know how the body responds to stress. We also know the many different ways to introduce different stresses to get outcomes. And so from a, from a, 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 a physiological standpoint, we're pretty accomplished. That there's not a lot we don't know. We're still learning about fascia a little bit. There's still a lot to learn about the nervous system, but we understand it. Technical, tactical work, skill acquisition, talent development, We've kind of got an idea of that, but there's two areas that I believe offer the greatest, the greatest potential for pushing human performance forward. And this is not just in sport. This is across the board. And those two are the brain and technology. Technology, of course, and equipment that we use, better bats, running shoes. I mean, we've seen the influence of just equipment in the Olympics from the uh, shark skin Speedo suits in Rome in 2009, was it? 37 or 46 world records fell at that FINA world championships in Rome that year. And they actually had to put limits on the amount of coverage these suits have much like in golf, Tim, you know, they're limiting the clubs and the balls because man, guys are driving it a thousand yards now. So technology is certainly going to help us get better, but the technology that's allowing us to understand and train and deal with the mind real time. This is where I think some of the greatest, greatest potential is. And now with our understanding of how the brain works, learns, and deals with input, processes, and sends out output to the body, it's an incredibly exciting time. So, so you know, where we're at right now um, is, is a really, really exciting time in human performance, I believe. And the brain is the next big area of, of potential, I believe. So we're, we're basically, if you're thinking about it, we're slowing down the process right now if we don't understand the brain. Slowing down the process right now if we don't understand the brain. Wait a second, let me, uh, sorry guys. Michael, uh, mute the mic, please. I don't know if you heard the question or not. Uh, Tim, did you hear? I didn't hear a question. No, from that's right. no, no, my question is, you know, first of all, I think something Crush said uh, I thought was very important, and that is, for coaches to understand it simply because you know a lot of th this stuff can get complicated but if it's if it's talked about in a simple manner it's easily understood we need to start this process and i keep saying this about all development you know a lot of times we wait till they get older we need to start this process with our young kids what does that look like i guess as a coach well how does it what does that look like where do you start it doesn't, with, it doesn't come in as a coach it really comes in you know, for the entire general population. I mean, if you're going to try and extend the life of a human being, you know, say five years or six years or whatever we can get, uh, it'll come because the brain is working more efficiently. The body, you know, it, it knows how to replenish itself. It does a lot of things uniquely in and of itself, metab metabolism wise. But the brain, uh, because it's so electrical, you know, we have to, to understand that you're probably going to go into a PE classroom in the future, and there's going to be several implicit exercises that you'll need to do in that PE setting, simply because whether you're a special needs kid or you're a 
a below average academic or you're an above average academic. It makes no difference. Uh, every brain can become more efficient because that's its goal, you know, and, uh, you know, when you look at in time, when uh, Jeff just said, you know, if we can see this information in real time. Well, we can't see it in real time. We have, there's no real time that we can experience here simply because the speed of light, which is the information that we are receiving from the environment is traveling at 186,000 miles a second. The speed of thought is about 284 miles an hour. So when you look at the disconnect between actual time, the time we see as the speed of light, real time, uh, the, that is where the present actually is. And we can't get there. We don't travel that fast. Our brains don't work that fast. Therefore, all information we are receiving, whether it's from technology or from our perception, is still a delayed form of information. Uh, it, say uh, you hit the send button on your phone. There's a radio wave travel at the speed of light. It'll go around the earth seven and a half times in one second. Hmm. You hit the send button on an electrical impulse in your brain to go around the earth at impulse speed. It'll take it three and a half days to get around the earth one time. When you do the short math or the long math, it doesn't make much difference. Uh, in the short math, you're about three quarters of a second in delay. In the long math, you're 27 days in the past. So when you do the math, when a physicist does the math for perceptual reality and actual reality, and what we see in the game is like a hitter making what we would call instant adjustments to a pitch. You know, he's actually, it appears as if his body has made the adjustments in while the ball was in flight, but that's not true. It's mathematically impossible. You're seeing uh, something that occurred previously and that the brain actually used the body, Jeff, and you're seeing what the brain saw and you're not seeing it in real time. You, you're a long way from real time. You know, therefore, we, we may have a chance to make some adjustments and see if the body fires differently, but it'll fire differently according to how it's standing in the box and where its hands are, where its hips are, where it actually perceptually sees itself in that time. So. Russ, can you, can you explain for us, because we'll have coaches watching this at different levels, explain a little bit about the implicit training, explicit training, the yeah, difference it's really, between it's, the two? Yeah. Yeah, it's a really important concept. Yeah. And Tim, this is just, so, it's so fun talking about this stuff. You know, um, the Yale, the Yale physicist, um, um, uh, his name, uh, Robert, Robert Adair, I believe was his name. He, you know, he was one of the guys studying baseball and he just, he, he wasn't a baseball or a sports guy at all. And he came out and said, look, this is just an absolute impossible task hitting uh you know <laughs> knowing what we know today hitting a baseball real time if you think about it you know based on what he said it, it it would really really appear like an impossible task but yet yet we have guys executing it at high high levels so it's really really interesting how it all works implicit training for the coaches out there it's kind of like unintentional learning it's it's things that you learn uh, because of what's happening around you, if that's a good way, if that's a good way to put it. But um, there's little to no instruction involved in implicit training. Um, and that's where, you know, with Tim and some of the conversations we've had, it's about creating an environment that will lead your body down the path to learnings, right? Very, very little input from coaches. Explicit learning is kind of the classical way we go about it. It's very, very coach focused. And there's a place for it. There certainly is because Players will need guidance, just like human beings need guidance along the way. But we find that some of the most powerful learning experiences are those ones that the athlete or the subject or the employee or the child uh, figures out on their own. Now, the key here is um, manipulating the environment to get the outcomes that you, that you want. That's the real trick to the trade. And there's a lot of cool things like, you know, that Tim's working on that's happening right now. You know, just think about what Tim said about, about hitting a baseball and where we are in time and how the brain perceives. And yet we navigate and manipulate our environments 
with incredible accuracy every single day. It's a fascinating, almost conundrum is what I would call it, Tim. You know, if you look at a 95 mile an hour fastball coming from a major league pitcher, you know, based on the tight of the guy and the leverage and the release point and everything, it reaches home plate in about 400 milliseconds. And, you know, in that time, you have to identify the ball trajectory, speed, decide whether you're going to swing. You have to decide to start your swing. Once your swing starts, you're committed. And then you have to try to make contact within an eighth of an inch of dead center on a round ball coming at you spinning. It's insanity if you really think about it, right? And yeah. one of my favorite, hey, one of my favorite pictures ever, I don't know if you guys, I, I put it in my presentations all the time, but the Calvin and Hobbes picture where Calvin is throwing a ball up, trying to hit it, throwing up, trying to hit it, throws the bat away, puts the baseball on the ground, gets a golf club and boom, smacks it with a golf club, right? <laughs> Just a great image kind of that depicts how difficult it truly, truly is. But getting an understanding of how the process works is really important. That's why today's conversation, man, oh man, you know, if our, if our job is to get people thinking about things they might not think about, that's kind of what's happening today already. And, and you know, if you look at all the different ways we can help our athletes achieve, um, perception and the information that gets to the brain is one of the top priorities. We focus so much on the physical side and through, just think about youth development. We spend very, very little time or no time at all talking, teaching, or even just discussing how we perceive our environments. And it's one of the most important things. If we can make that change, again, there's an exponential, I believe there's an exponential return here. If we were to start this earlier, you know, we might, and again, it, it would have to be time sensitive because the brain develops over time as well, right? What the brain is capable of doing when Hang on, crush one out for a second. Tim, you want to pick up there? I will. You know, the uh, when you're the big issue 24 is very, Hang very on. different than when you're crush is back. Crush, you there? Gotcha. Go ahead, crush. Yeah, I got you. Sorry, sorry. I don't know what happened there, guys. So I don't know what, what you heard. I think last you moved there. too fast. Ah, uh, yeah. You're doing great. Uh, yeah. You're doing where, great. Where, where was I when it cut out there? What's that? Where, where was I? What was I saying when it, when it cut out there? I didn't catch the end, um, but you were talking about, well, you were talking about a lot of stuff. I, I'm not sure exactly where it cut. Okay, well, you know, okay. We're, just, just we're just basically saying, you know, th this is a very, very important part of development because, you know, we know the windows of opportunity for physical development. We know when the first window for speed happens. We know when suppleness and cardiovascular performance happens in the timeline of development for an athlete. We know when skill acquisition happens. We know in relation to peak height velocities from a physical standpoint, what needs to happen there. We also know when pure strength training is really, really going to serve a purpose. And that's well after you're done your growth curve. But what we don't really talk about is the mental side and the stages of development of the brain along the path. And if we can start coordinating that, I think we're really going to open up windows of potential. And I also do believe, if I didn't come through last time, there will be an exponential return on that. I mean, you start learning the proper things in 9, 10, 11 years old that matches the development of your brain. Um, there's going to be an exponential developmental curve that's going to allow you to do things you would never be able to do when you're 13, 14, and 15, if that makes sense. Tim, I don't know if you agree with that. I know you and I have talked about this before. Instructors and developers, I mean, for me, I mean, we're in the infancy stage of understanding the brain, no doubt. I mean, we may be 500 years or 1,000 years away from really understanding it well enough, you know, kind of like we would, we would say we understand the body right now. I mean, we're a long ways from being yeah, correct, you know. So my main focus is just try to lay the, the correct foundation and help everybody understand and see what is actually in here. You know, when you see that we can't do, like Adair was talking about, I mean, it's a physical impossibility because you can't think and hit. Okay, so how, how, what is the brain actually doing? And you have to understand the components, the pitcher and the batter inside the brain, you know, they're not, they're probably a 32nd of an inch apart, probably not that much. I mean, the information that's traveling at 284 miles an hour isn't traveling from one 
spot of the brain to the other. The, the batter's not over here and the pitcher over here in the brain. They're that close together. And that's what all the new data is showing. I saw some research from Rob out at Arizona State this week about when the pitcher's body moves, the batter's body moves. And it's because inside the brain, they're mirrored images. They're, they're in the same space. So if the water moves over here, this guy's got to move because that's the way space is inside the brain. Space is providing the pitcher information. Space is providing the batter information. If, if nothing moves, if the space doesn't move, then you have an illusion. You have a, a mirrored illusional effect. And you can, you can understand that, you know, because we see a lot of that in uh, TV work and occlusion work and you see virtual reality goggles and all that stuff, but it's just affecting one layer of space. The entire conundrum of space isn't moving at all. I mean, it's just an illusion. It's a mirrored image. And for it to be real and for us to have these learning experiences, you have to be learning in your natural environment because that's how the brain was wired. And, and yeah. speaking, I want to jump in for a second. Speaking about that natural environment, either one of you guys can talk about this. You know, let, let's just look at the world. Um, there's a lot of places, you know, you look at Latin America, there's a lot of places, Cuba, Me uh, Mexico, wherever it may be, uh, Dominican Republic. A lot of these kids grew up just playing the game on their own. That's how we grew up playing the game. Is that where the development stage starts? Because right now it's so organized that coaches are controlling everything at the seven-year-old level, eight-year-old level, 10, 12. There's so much control. Is that what I mean? So we need to change the system a little bit to fit this type of development. You have to implicitly, you'll have to exercise those neurons implicitly to get the same effect. Say you're in North America, say you're in Michigan or Pennsylvania or somewhere up north there toward Jeff there. Uh, the angle of the sun at that location is very different than the angle of the sun near the equator. There's more botanical life, there's more fish life, there's more life near the equator because of the natural environment there. And it has to, it has to be depicted inside the human brain as well. Uh, you can't just have an environment that's void of us. I mean, our brains will adapt to that angle of the sun as well. That's why I've always stated, I stated in my book that hitters from Central America and players from Central America are naturally going to be better than us, not because the weather's different, but because their brains are wired to space differently. They have different algorithms that are running in their brain. I mean, we can't, it's kind of like the Chinese doing math and, and Americans doing math. Their language gives them a huge advantage for us. Their megabit capacity changes because they're da 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 It's a very different, it's not long, longhand, it's shorthand, it's digital. And for that environment down there, uh, it's very different. Now, they, I love that they're in open spaces a lot more. We train a lot indoors, and that means that our spatial neurons aren't being exercised at all. Mm. To me, you should see us getting worse over the next 30 or 40 years instead of better if we don't change the environment. And I don't mean the environment that you're talking about, you know, as far as taking so many swings or taking more lessons or anything like that. We have to, we have to have an awakening to the spatial neurons that information is traveling through. If we don't recognize that the space is where the information is coming through and try to manipulate the consistency of that space and how many neurons are active while you're training, then the deal's done, man. You, you've maxed out. You're going to be right where you are. Your physical body, they'll keep trying, they'll keep trying data on you and learning all that kind of, kind of data stuff. But we have to, we have to lay the foundation that everything travels through neurological space and all space isn't created equal because of the way the sun hits the earth and how the earth is tilted. It's very different. Gosh. So, so imagine that, like how fascinating is that? And, and, you know, Tim and I've had these discussions before and, and it's incredible. If you look at all the factors that influence, you know, performance outcomes, long-term in development. So let's, let's just, let's just set the record straight here. Okay. Um, trying to build high performance athletes 
is a very, very difficult, hard, unsuccessful road to come down. If you have a great process, if you have a great process of development over time, you, you know, what you get is more people participating, fewer dropouts, better learning rates, and the great outcome of a, of a good process is going to be more high performing athletes. But to go in at the start thinking high performance, oh boy, I think it's a really risky, risky game to play. So let's just consider some of the major factors that are influencing kids and athletes going into that high performance pathway right now. Well, think about what Tim just said, your relationship to the sun, your relationship, in, we're talking big space here. And Tim, I love the conversations we have when we start talking about virtual reality. There was so much promise and hype and you know, when virtual reality really started coming together, there was a lot of excitement around virtual reality until we started understanding it's a virtual reality, not reality, right? Um, and those points of space in terms of learning and awareness and your ability to move, react, and, 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 and get a task done really, really depends on those points of reference in space together. Millions and millions, maybe trillions, Tim. I'm not sure what the number is, billions or trillions, but all those points in space together that need to feed into our, our minds. So one of the things that we've done with our athletes, you know, um, whether it's our hitters, our fielders in every single sport, is we try to protect the information that's coming into the, the brain. And mainly for our sports, it's the visual information coming in. So when we start training our movement patterns, we're really aware of eye movement and how the, how the eyes are moving in relationship to the ball, to the task at hand. Uh, because the more pure the information getting in, the better decisions, reactions, and process the brain can have. So that's important. The sun is impacting our ability to perform or our, 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 our placement on this earth is, is determining our abilities to perform, you know, based on what Tim said. We also know that the relative age effect, you're, if you have a sporting system that is designed around birth dates, uh, January 1st is your cutoff. We know that that one year of development is a massive, massive influence in the lifetime of an athlete, which really impacts who gets selected the rep teams who gets the better coaching who gets the better experiences early on it doesn't mean at the end of the day they're going to be the most talented it just happens in the timeline of their development they're at a higher level of development at that time every coach on the planet needs to be aware of the impact of the relative age but there's also the birthplace effect uh, you know a great canadian sociologist discovered it actually his wife discovered it they're at a junior i think it was world junior hockey championships uh, Roger Barnsley and his wife and they're sitting there and his wife was looking at the um, at the program for the day and it was Czechoslovakia I think was playing Team Canada or something like this but she was just looking at the the bios of all the players for Czech Republic and then the other team she's she says to her husband who's a renowned sociologist she goes hey what do you see hey there's something what do you notice about all these players so he looks at him oh man look they're all giant they're like they're all six foot they're all you know big big developed boys, you know, they're, they're giant. They're, she goes, no, no, no. She goes, you know, look, look, look where they're, look where they're from. Like, you know, this is the start of the, the, the relative age thing, which led on to our understanding of the birthplace effect, which shows us across the board. If you look at the high performers in every major sport, there's more high performance athletes coming from the small towns than there is the big cities. And that has a lot to do with, you know, their ability to have access to space, fields. space, exactly. <laughs> space, facilities, space. Their, brain, their brains are building buildings instead of building space. That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful analogy. So all of these factors come into play. So what can you do as a coach if you're in inner city New York? Well, you know, you've got to be creative, but just being aware of this stuff can really help you create an environment for your kids that, that, that will be conducive to, to maybe better learning. A lot of sociologists, you know, I taught sociology for three years, psychology for three years, and we do fully understand now that putting people inside buildings, no different than a plant, you know, they function differently. Their brainwave patterns change, their mood changes, everything about them changes when they go inside. And it's all tied to 
the energy that's available to them outdoors versus what's inside that space because there's more space than there is objects here on earth. So the brain has to be well equipped to make space. That You know, the number one cause of blindness in America is cortical blindness. It has nothing to do with the eyes. It's the cortex that's damaged. The eyes can send great signals, but the brain really is struggling uh, to actually make the complexity of space because it's a low resolution, low energy. It has to be perfect or you will not, it just won't make vision for you. You know, since we're on that, Tim, explain to us the VFLEX, the technology, how that actually works. Um, and, and simple, and simple, simple notion. You know, I just look at all of space as common space. Uh, my neurons are very active within that common space. So if I'm, whether I'm in a batting cage inside a building, I know that I'm going to have limited access to spatial energy. Uh, if I'm outside, I'm going to have my maximum uh, availability of energy that I'll have there. But still, no matter where I am, it's still all common because across the whole spectrum of space, it's just common wavelengths. There's nothing extraordinary about a specific space. So my prompters that I put in front of hitters and I put in front of uh, pitchers create a, a unique heat signature of electricity inside the brain so that we break away from common space and we make a specific space. I can make it a circle, I can make it a rectangle, an octagon. I just have to put the prompters in a specific place where that the brain will begin to fire these action potentials and create a unique space. And that's the implicit nature of this training. It's not what you see because I don't make complete images. I make partial images and I don't ask you to mentally make them. I'm talking to the brain in its original language, which is electrical impulses. I wanted to fire an impulse here, an impulse here, and an impulse here. And the end result is it'll tell me what it's actually seeing. It, it's a heat signature. And it's the same technology that heat seeking missiles use when tracking down an F-18 fighter plane, you know, uh, the radar is going left and right, scanning extremely fast within space. And the only thing that it can actually pick up on in that space is the difference between the temperature here and the temperature here. And it will find that discrepancy if you know that's how the guys that built the radar system, you know. And that's how I I wanted to build my system. I worked with uh, F-18 fighter pilot uh, Jansen Buckner, Captain Buckner, with the Navy. You know, and, and he was telling me, uh, I've learned so much from him about, you know, radar systems. And when radar systems hit the water, how deep do these waves go under the water to actually find a submarine? You know, and he told me, he said, it's the, it depends on the temperature of the water. He said, everything affects everything. He said, nothing works consistently all the time when you're dealing with a, 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 a wave system but there are some consistencies that you have to be aware of. And when he taught me about the, the heat seeking missile is like, man, that's how my brain knows where the strike zone is now. You know, we've been able to create that unique space so that the brain is just sitting there anticipating a strike coming through that space. If the strike doesn't come through that space, there'll be no firing. There'll be no, Tim, I just want to, I want folks to know, go, go to Twitter at VFlex Sports uh, and you'll see the devices. But I want, here, I want you to explain this. I'm a pitcher. You're working with the pitcher on the with the device. Mm -hmm. When they're throwing the ball, it's going, it looks like it's going through a tunnel. I, I'm very naive at this. So take me through that a little bit. So as a coach, I understand how that works. From, uh, the, pitcher, from the pitching standpoint, oh, they won't take the hitting side too. On the pitching side, all three of those pieces, you have a large piece, a medium piece, and a small piece. Uh, what I'm doing with the larger piece is exercising the largest amount of peripheral neurons hmm. because I, I need to pull information from the peripheral vision. There's 300 million more neurons in the periphery than in your central vision. So I'm not really interested in your central vision. It's pretty well developed. It's how much information can I gather from out here? So when we look at pulling uh, amperage to create my unique space, uh, that larger piece would be equivalent to, in Jeff's world, of lifting 20 pounds of physical weight. 
because we're forcing the brain to fire millions of more neurons that it's not used to firing in common space. So you put the seven footer there, you put the five footer behind it and say it would be equivalent to 10 pounds of electrical weight or physical weight. And then the unique design back at home plate, the what I would consider a virtual strike zone. When, when guys talk about virtual reality and putting goggles on, then you, in, you're immersed in this, uh, this world of virtual, virtual reality. That's not what virtual is to me. Virtual to me is the strike zone that I'm creating at home plate is a virtual strike zone because the only thing that's seeing it is your brain. It's not an eye image. I've, I've got the prompters placed in specific ways in specific places so that the image doesn't appear on the retina of the eye. It's not a physical image. It's not in the real world. It's actually a virtual strike zone. Your brain is sitting there making a heat signature strike zone for you. Now, depending on how you re how your brain rewards itself, whether it throws a pitch inside of it, outside of it, depending on what the task and the intent is, that'll be completely up to each individual's brain because we don't know if the brain will use serotonin or uh, dopamine or adrenaline. We don't know how it'll actually signature that, that behavior so that it can try to repeat that over time because it's seeking a reward. It's not seeking a behavior. It could care less what the freaking behavior is. It's seeking a reward. Yeah. So, can so you as you throw a strike, as you throw a strike consistently in a certain zone, your brain is constantly remembering that? It's, it's not remembering it. It's actually no different than strengthening a muscle. I mean, if you lift weights, your muscles get stronger. We know that through resistance. We just didn't know how to electrically make the neurons exercise so that they become stronger. And stronger doesn't mean lift more weights to the brain. Stronger to them means it can carry more electrical current and do it more efficiently, which means when you're under pressure in a game and all these neurotransmitters are firing and you're nervous or anxious, if you've worked that system correctly, it won't affect you at all. That's why implicit training is a known way for peak performance. Because you don't, you don't, you don't know why you're getting better. The tools that you're using are doing the job for you because we speak English and we, as instructors, we need to learn how to be electrical engineers, not wires and plugs and light switches, but we really need to know how to turn electrical impulses on so that the brain gets its daily exercise. Crush, I know so, you want to add. So, so think, yeah, so think about this. And this is just so fascinating, man. What a great conversation, but it's fascinating. Just think about it. And what Tim's talking about is, you know, you talk about implicit training, the environment causing a, tra a change that you're really not aware of. You learn without consciously being aware of it. Well, you know, a great analogy that we talk about sometimes when we look at what happens in the brain when you actually do something even repetitive, repetitively. Um, you know, one of the famous experiments early on when we st first started understanding this was the, was the experiment with the um, London taxi drivers, the black cab taxi drivers, where they looked at the area of the brain that's responsible for mapping, conscious decision making, the hippocampus, the hippocampus. It was actually larger in the taxi drivers than it was the average person. And that was a direct result of the constant information, constant stress they put on the brain to overcome their problems. The brain adapted to what was going on. So one thing you need to know about the, the black cab taxi drivers, in order to become a black cab taxi drivers, and if you guys want to Google up a map of London, you need it's to know every little nook and cranny impossible. in that city. Uh, talk about an impossible task, just like, you know, <laughs> our, our Yale I've been there. impossible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. But isn't that interesting, though? And, and that's just one of the early examples. We're now seeing it in our baseball players. We're seeing it in our basketball players, our golfers, for sure. We're seeing it on assembly line workers. The brain literally changing based on the stress and information from our environment. That's how sensitive it is. And I, you know, I'm encouraged by everything. But like Tim said, we're probably hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years of really mastering it. 
but we're on the forefront of something that's incredibly, incredibly exciting. You know, we're throwing out words now, implicit, explicit uh, training. We talk about variable training mm -hmm. systems, the chaos. dynamic training theory chaos. systems, you know? Chaos and training. Chaos training. It's all coming together. None of it's really new. We're just right. packaging and marketing it now. We've always been doing it. It's always happened since human beings walked the earth. But now we're packaging it, understanding it, and actually trying to systemize it, which, which is okay, too. I just think we're a long ways from mastering it. Crush, I think I, if, I, if I were uh -huh. guessing, I would say we're probably, you know, V-Flex Technologies, we're an easy 50 years ahead of our time. Yeah, we could well, easily I agree, be a, We could easily yeah. be 100 years ahead of our time. Yeah. And the only reason that I, I say that is because even the guys that use our equipment, that know our equipment a little bit, they've, they've not been able to go beyond a basic comprehension of, of the, the skills that we're, that we're exercising. They really can't see space. They don't really understand that space is transparent. It's not uh, invisible. In here, it's transparent. Out here, we, we perceive it as invisible, but it's not. It's, it's simply, and it's a, deep, it's a very difficult thing to try and comprehend, you know, and it, it may turn out that we were two or 300 years ahead of our time. You know, when it goes mainstream in school systems, in gymnasiums, or in workout facilities, in the Olympics, or multiple sports, whether it's archery, we just received an archery patent, and a shooting pattern, you know, we're going to infiltrate every sport that's ever been, you know, and we're going to do some fun things uh, through the whole process, but I, I won't be alive when it's all, when it matures, I'll be dead. I'll be long dead when this thing matures. Wow. We are at the infancy. I mean, it's incredible. Crush, what about, you know, in, here in the U S I'm going to take it to the baseball side a little bit here in the U S um, we've got to change our, thinking a little bit when it comes to younger teams then. And I hate to get to, you know, talk about that, but it's important because that's where it all starts. Um, well, what, what, what do we yeah, change yeah. here? I, I get yeah. the implicit training, but what else do yeah. we change? Well, I, I think, I think we got to get this, this, I think this conversation, Pete runs a little bit deeper than, than what we're talking about today. <laughs> uh, though this is incredibly important. I think, you know, if you look at the state of youth sport today, I mean, we're going, down a, we're going down a different path right now, but this has to be discussed. If we're talking about youth development and really, really tapping in and giving those kids a great experience. So if they decide to pursue sport or accounting or mechanics or, or carpentry, whatever they decide to do, um, they're healthy, functional human beings. Sport, I believe, is a big, big part of the life process. What's failing more in youth sport than anything else, before we can even start talking about this, is we've got to have our systems in place. And kids, it, look, we're looking at it at a period of time, we have an all time high dropout rate in organized sport. What an absolute tragedy. And if we really understand that problem, then we can start formulating a plan to fix that so we can actually apply some of the things we're talking today. So I think one of the biggest problems we're seeing is we need to address this dropout rate. Kids aren't having fun in organized sports. All the adults have turned it into this big competitive win at all costs scenario. Youth sport is a $19 billion industry right now. It generates more revenue than any of the professional sports, private mm -hmm. lessons, year round clubs, travel teams, indoor facilities. It's an absolute freaking disaster. As soon as youth sport turned into a monetary business, we were doomed. Now we have an opportunity to fix it. So we got to go back to understanding why kids play. And I have to go back to some of the greatest work done here is done by Amanda Visick and her group at George Washington University, the fun maps um, work that they've done, why kids play sport. And we've talked about this quite often. I don't think we talk about it enough, but if you look at it, the number one reason kids play sport is to have fun, not to get yelled at, not to get, you know, criticized, not to, not to, not to, not to go out there and even compete. They go out there to have fun with their friends. They identified, they, they interviewed thousands and thousands and thousands of youth athletes of all different age groups. And they identified a very succinct 81 factors that contribute to why kids play, fun factors. And if you look at where winning lies in those 81, in the hierarchy of 81, it wasn't in the top 10. 
it wasn't in the top 20. It barely made the top half of those 81. It was number 48. Winning is such a low priority for kids. It was number 48 of 81 factors of why kids play. Listen, until we fix that, we're going to have a hard time really, really impacting the outcomes that we're seeing. Now, once we get that, and there are a few organizations that are doing it well, now this gets really, really exciting, right? And right alongside, you know, that is the obesity rates and the education of nutrition. And like Tim said, the, the absence of physical education in schools. Mm -hmm. We're taking education and physical activity out when it's probably the most valuable component of academic skills and academic scores. We know that kids who are more active have better scores, better memory, better rest. They're healthier human beings as well. Why are we not actually adding more physical activity, Absolutely. whether it's fun or structured in our school days, then taking it out and cramming on books? We know for a fact that if they were more, if kids were more active every day, they would have better academic scores. If that's your outcome, we'd also have a healthier population. Now that being said, we get to the role of biochemistry, like chemistry feeds everything. And as Tim said, something really interesting in his opening remarks that, that the, the, the brain is a master regulator of energy. It's also a glutton. It is the biggest draw of energy in the human body. I mean, we're burning, you know, 5.7 kilograms of ATP a day. That's like, that's like boatloads of energy, right? It's just, it's like, it's just like a, it's sucking up energy like crazy. And that's why after a huge effort, like a Wingate test or a sprint, I don't know if you guys have ever passed out after a high intensity effort or after an effort, blood chemistry gets, this is how smart the brain is, right? Your organs have some control over blood flow and everything, but don't be fooled. The brain is the master controller of everything. So I was doing the Wingate test in university and, you know, I did it a couple of times, but this one time, I don't know if I didn't eat right, or I don't know if I just hammered it right, or it was the wrong time of day, but I busted it out. I got great power scores. My, my fatigue index was really good. So I was pretty proud of my scores. About two minutes afterwards, however, I just, it's exactly like a movie scene, you know? Yeah. I'm laying on the ground and I hear in the way in the distance, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. And, and then, you know, fade in, boom, the roof of the exercise physiology lab. Cause I was flat out on my back. What happens is the brain, the brain uh, senses a lack of nutrition, a lack of energy, a lack of nutrients. And it literally shuts down the body to make sure the brain gets everything it needs. It's priority number one. Mm. And so as we're talking about all this great training and everything, you got to think about the impact of our number two priority in human performance, which is nutrition and hydration. If we're not feeding this body properly, I don't give a rat's behind how well you're training it. It's going to be very, very difficult to optimize performance and, and maximize outcomes. And again, that goes back to our, our sides. Tim's been spending his entire lifetime, you know, understanding the thing here. We've been on working the last 16 years trying to understand how to truly, truly feed this thing. And that's our KP sport drink. And again, you know, humbly, I say, we are 10, 20 years ahead of the nutrition curve and we're, we're on the war. We're on a war path to do things better because we understand you can't just feed the body and hope that it operates properly, especially when it comes to high performance outcomes. Why would you feed a baseball player with the stress in that environment the same as a basketball player? You can't. It doesn't make sense. Never has. It never will. We can actually now we figured out how to target that. Now imagine this. Imagine we're fueling this thing better. And I'm, our number one focus is the brain. That's our tagline, switch the brain, switch the game. We're feeding the brain better. We're training the brain better. And hopefully we're going to see some incredible outcomes. We already are. Hey guys, I, you guys are on a roll and I don't want to screw this up. So Tim, you're on. Oh man. No, <laughs> hey, I, I completely agree with, with Crush. Or Crucial, or how you want to say it. Crush is fine. There. Yeah, that's fine, Tim. Crush, yeah. uh, the crusher. Crucial. The crusher. Uh, with, with boring kids to death, you know, that, that was my big deal about these implicit tools going into training academies and going into the places that they need to go to. I've seen so many uh, pitching lessons and so many uh, hitting lessons, and I'm in tears. I mean, I'm a grown man. And I feel for 
the generations that have been previous to us. But now the generations that we're accountable for, that are within our time and our sphere of influence, we're going to be, we're held accountable for that. You know, you can play stupid if you want to play stupid. You don't have to use any new tools. You don't have to do anything new. But now people that, that are intelligent, they know you're down here in the country. We call you stupid. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because uh, if you know to do something that'll help a person and you refuse to do that, uh, there's something missing in your life. You're, you're, you just, I just can't, I can't understand it, but I do want to see, you know, these hitting academies and, and teams and see these guys that have 20 and 30 years of experience show that they have adaptability in their mind that they can say, Hey, I can see how this tool can work. My college coach, you know, uh, just passed away and, uh, coach Steve Peterson and, uh, he was one of the old school guys, hard, hard ass guy, you know, and for him and a guy like Tony Gwynn to come in and say, my God, that's the best tool I've seen in 30 years. You know why? Because Tony Gwynn told me when I pitched to him, he said, that's the clearest I've ever seen a baseball in my life. He said, I've hit a million baseballs. He said, I've never seen a baseball that clear in my life. And he asked me, he said, why is that? And I said, it's because I've got your neurons excited where the ball's actually going to come through. And it altered his perception of that space. You know, it, it turned into perceptual reality, but we had to create that physical reality before the perceptual reality could actually be made. And very few guys understand that. I mean, I, I can tell you, it's very difficult. But I'm, I'm, I know with guys like Jeff, and there are a, a handful of guys across the United States, maybe around the world, you know, just a handful that, that will take the reins and run with it and see if we can't make this uh, implicit turn, you know, make it happen. Because it's like Jeff said, I mean, you have to feed the brain. It, it's going to suck up a lot of energy, man. It really does. And it has to be uh, fueled for that. But that's why the brain has tried to use the law of diminishing returns, you know, as its benchmark. You know, when you have a guy do mental training, it takes energy to have a thought. I mean, it's expensive to think. And the brain will only think so much. You know, uh, neurologically, it has about 60,000 thoughts a day. 50,000 of them never reach the conscious state. Only about 10,000 thoughts a day matter at all, and probably no more than 100 require a yes and a no. They're just subliminal messages to yourself. You know, you're weighing truth and consequences uh, along the way, and it does that internally. But we well, have to be... I, I could be, I could, I could be a testimony of this, and I'll tell you why. You saw me smiling. I'm surrounded by two guys, and my head hurts right now. So, which means I'm thinking way too much. Um, no, and, and I say that in a kidding way, but I understand where you're coming from. I mean, I'm getting this because, and I, I'm going to make a statement, and my statement will be, you know, if if I don't have it, if I don't have, if I don't feed the brain, if I don't have that energy, the brain's going to do something else, right? If I'm trying to throw a baseball. And the, the body's not ready for that. My brain's going to say, well, I got to control my body, but I can't do that because I don't have enough energy. So I'm going to try to take the energy from somewhere, I would assume. It's not going to be towards the training aspect or thinking about what you're doing. Is that that's a correct. That, and that's the problem with the, the, youth, the youth falling out of the sports world. Yeah. It's because the, the lessons that I've seen from the experts, they're not experts. They're, they're making a guy think about his hips and his legs and his arms and his posture and his launch angle. And the thought process is, is taking all of the energy. And when you finally give him 10 pitches to hit, he's freaking worn out. You know, his, his brain has been sitting there trying to, to do a lot of thinking. It's wasted so much energy when it could have been processing information from its environment. Yeah. And I'm just disheartened by it, man. I mean, yeah. I, 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 me get, one time I would have given my right arm and two left nuts to, to play professional <laughs> baseball 
you know, uh, and do some things, but not now, not after I've seen the system at work. And uh, it, it's it's just disheartening to watch. Go ahead, Chris. So, Sorry. Yeah. So so listen. Yeah, Tim, I'm so with you. I'm so with you. So frustrating. And, and you know what? That's why we just have to have discussions. We just have to see if we can get people thinking about things and not that we know it all. I'm in a constant state of, of, of learning. There's no question about it, but there's things that we do know. For example, in, in, in the world of talent research, talent and skill acquisition, here's what we know. There is a certain period of time that is optimizing and most effective for learning. Now, as a coach in this industry of baseball that, or this youth, youth sport that we've, that we've developed, um, that has gone down the entirely wrong path because people have now paid their mortgage and their college tuitions and their car payments teaching kids. Well, we know the most valuable time in skill development and talent acquisition, and a lot of this comes out of the music world, um, is not when you're with your coach learning. It's not when you're even with your, your, with your team playing. The most valuable time for learning is taking what your coach has helped you with maybe, or what you've been doing with your team, but it's when you're in your backyard by yourself with nobody watching, nobody judging, or maybe you're out at the, at the park with your buddies, just horsing around, having fun. That is where the most developmental time, most powerful developmental time happens. That's, that's without question. And if we were smart, we would program that into our youth development cycles. All right. It's a no coaching day. There's the bats. There's the balls. You guys pick the teams. You guys pick the game. Go out there. I'll just make sure if somebody gets hurt, we'll get them to the hospital, right? Hopefully, <laughs> you know, one of the two oh, most great. valuable things, the two most valuable things I think we can do for our youth today is help them become problem solvers and decision makers. If we could do that in the world of sport, help that, help, help that, you know, away from the parents, because we all know our relationship with our parents, which is good. You know, there's value there, but it needs to be, there needs to be a point of independence. And that's where we say, you know, Crush will be back in a second. He froze up. I'm that sure happened. he will. That happens. If you jump back in. So and today, if we look at the landscape, of, let's take professional sport. Am I back? Yep. Yep. Yes. And then you, you, you talked about problem solving and decision making being the two most important things right now that young kids should be learning, you know, or coaches should be letting kids do. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and, and away from their parents. This has to be something, that's why youth sport is so great. Get away from the parents, kind of independent, right? The coach should be there to guide. And, you know, if you look at the implicit training, implicit learning, right, it is one of the most powerful ways because, listen, you're, you're learning without actually knowing you're learning. So if we can set up environments that, that cause an outcome, you know, if you take, um, take for example, like, um, well, <laughs> the V-Flex, <laughs> right? Technology. <laughs> technology the v-flex though you're learning something without it you, you're learning you don't even know you're learning and mm -hmm. that's why i say today guys and this might be you know a good discussion for today i'd like to hear your opinion on this i've got, i've got this opinion that i've sort of developed over the last little bit that you know we have some great players in professional sport if we talk baseball today we know who those great great players are i mean you look at trout harper you know you look at these these guys who are really really carving a path but i, I could probably comfortably say Two, two major points that I, I think I'm pretty confident in saying. One is through the developmental cycle, we're destroying more talent than we're creating today. No Unfortunately, that's just, that's just the way it is. Injuries, dropout rates, it's just a disaster. But number two, we're, we, don't, we don't have the best athletes, the best players at the top of sport. What we do have is the best players who survive the system that we have. But can you imagine if we took the population – and put them through a really, really good, whether they decide to go high performance pathways or not, uh, we would have an, an incredible recalibration in high performance sports, and it'd be much, much better than it is today. That's my opinion. You know, and I think, uh, Jeff, I think you're correct. And Baseball Canada, obviously, is in, has been in that direction for a while and has oh, proven so good. in baseball what players they've developed. But let me ask you this also. Do we see two extremes here? Um, Latin America, I mean, we're, you talk about implicit training, you're not going to get any more implicit than Latin America. Um, heavy, you know, heavy balls, light balls, you know, balls that are different sizes. I mean, you name it, different size bats, different size fields. Um, they just play on their own. And then you got Asia, 
which is extremely organized, you know, the Japanese, which train, you know, just constantly the same thing over and over again. Are we somewhere in the middle we need to be? Yeah, I think, I, I think personally there is, there is a happy medium to everything, right? There's a happy medium and there's a time for everything as well. There's time to be very specific and deliberate. There's also a time over the lifespan of an athlete, but also in annual planning. There's a time to do certain things. A lot of it revolves around the competitive cycle. Now you see certain, certain, you know, you look at Latin America, the number of players coming out of, let's say, uh, Dominican Republic right now. It's an incredible high number, Crazy. the second highest next to the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. But if we were to look at a truly successful developmental organization, you can't help but talk about Canada. Of course, they're sort of the brainchild behind this entire beautiful long-term development program, but we have to look what's going on in Norway. How mm -hmm. is it possible that a country with a population of 5.7 million uh, uh, wins more gold medals than any other country in the history of the Winter Olympics. Think about that one for a second. There are some very, very special things going on in Norway. And, you know, God forbid a country like the U.S. ever adopts that model. It would be scary as all get up. That's my opinion. But, but you know, those extreme, there's a time. There's a time and a place for all that over the course, the lifespan of an athlete but also in your annual planning. And, and that's the true art of coaching and athlete development, right? Mm -hmm. It's not cut and dry at any point. It's really reading and reacting, but understanding the big picture, right? Absolutely. Tim? Uh, I would, I'd like to circle back on one of the things that- oh, uh, oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry, Tim, real quick. My fault, I apologize, because Chris had a question relates to you. Um, he said, I understand Tim correctly, is hitting products hyper-focus the brain to look for the baseball to come through a specific space to see it more clearly? That is uh, absolute 100% correct. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, I sent you an article here a while back, you know, uh, creating nine identical hitters, mm -hmm. and I sent it to Jeff as well, you know, and it's simply because you can't train the brain to take a ball. It's a passive behavior. So you, you can only train a, an action. You can't train a passive behavior. Therefore, you have to give the brain a way to build the contrast. And that's what that hyper-focused area actually is. It's not a hyper-mental focus. And that's where I have, we've got to call everybody in on the carpet and say, okay, you know, I can't allow you, I can't be an enabler. I can't allow you to do certain things. I cannot allow you to be who you've always been. I can't allow you to train the same way you've always trained. If I, if I don't call you out, you know, then I'm complicit in, in uneducating you. I take my responsibility seriously and I, I don't want to screw the foundation up. You know, so you will have to train strike recognition, will, which will be expressed as ball efficiency. Mm. You'll begin to take more balls in a game. You'll understand the strike zone better, but it won't be because you've learned what a ball looks like. Uh, you, you can't train the behavior. The, the brain won't, will not give itself dopamine for a non-action. It will give itself dopamine for a proactive, awesome feel that it that is that it's doing. The problem is, for the last 200 years in the sport of baseball here, almost uh, that dopamine release has been at contact, and there's still going to be some dopamine release, and there's going to be some pleasure and epinephrine and uh, endorphins released when you hit the ball at home plate, even with V flex. But prior to that, the brain has to reward itself for recognizing space, something that came through the dang door, you know, that you've created, the window that you've created, because that's the only way that it knows to go ahead and fire the swing completely without reservation. You're going to hit more doubles, triples, and home runs, but it was because it was identified early not by your mind, because your mind's a lagger. It's because your brain is capable of hitting a baseball without you consciously being there, pretty much. 
you know, and the other thing I'd like to call out just a little bit about is, you know, Jeff mentioned uh, virtual reality. And there are some questionable things about virtual reality. And a lot of the ways we're trying to take shortcuts today to get to a higher performance uh, level. Uh, and if you can see this, I'll turn it a little bit, maybe. 60% off. 60% off. When you put a, a pair of... I thought that was our discount. No. <laughs> you get a discount, all right. You're discounted. I, I promise right. you, if you, put, if you put a pair of virtual reality goggles on a hitter, you're discounted. Hmm. 60%. New research from uh, UCLA in the rat research. And rats have very simple brains compared to our brains, but 60% of their spatial neurons shut off when they put virtual reality goggles on and put them in a virtual world, basically, is what they do but they can't see edges. They fall off of the tables that they're on and kill themselves. I mean, it's really unique world because we're tied to the space so uniquely. And I just have to say, hey, I don't care if every major league team in the country is, is training on a system. I don't care. It's irrelevant to me because I'm just looking at the data and the research. I'm not trying to sell a product or anything like that. I'm trying to protect a generation and make sure that we do keep those kids playing through as many years as possible uh, and understanding. But it, it still comes back to I'm not going to be complicit. I'm not going to be part of the good old boy club or whatever, whatever I would have to give up to be part of that gang. I can't do it because the research won't let me do it. Yeah, and I, I love that, Tim. Tim, I love everything about that. And, and I'm, I'm with you 100%. I think that's why we hit it off so well with this whole group here. And hey, uh, Pete, just my last comment here, just while it's on the top of my head. So you know what, in, in you know, talking about the dopamine response, if we just look at human beings, period. Sport is just something that human beings do. We're not made to throw a baseball or hit a golf ball or chase a football or, you know, we're, that's, we are built to respond to what happens in our environment. And that response is driven by neurochemistry, dopamine, serotonin, epinephrine, norepinephrine. It is all about the chemical response in the body. And if we can start understanding that, oh, oh watch out, things, you'll, things will get crazy. Things will get crazy. And that's why, you know, you talk about a reward system inside of baseball. Just think about that concept. Think about what we're talking about. It's revolutionary, it's groundbreaking, because we've never really thought about teaching a sport in, in that way before. But it's truly, truly one of the ways of the future for sure. And that being said, with everything that we've talked about today, I think, and Tim, I'd like to hear your comments on this and Pete as well. We could take any player, whether it's a veteran 10 year all-star in Major League Baseball, or whether it's a young player just starting out in T-ball, we could take any player on the planet right now and make them better. We just have to know what, what to do. We just have to know what to do for that individual. Over the course of development, there are certain windows of opportunity that, that have to be addressed because those windows, they close and you can't get that time back. So you can optimize experiences at certain times of development. You can really raise the potential of an athlete rather than lowering it. Right now, unfortunately, we're lowering potential across the board, I believe. But that being it's said, there's hope. It's because of the neurotransmitter, the way they're using their neurotransmitters, man. It's not right. pleasurable to them. That's why the kids are walking away. It's not fun. Yes, 100%, Tim. Exactly. That's what we're talking about today. But nobody's talking about this, unfortunately. That no. being said, there's hope. For everybody out there, there is hope. We, you can get better. I, I don't care if you're a perennial all-star in Major League Baseball. We can get you better, period. And if you're a young athlete or a parent of a young athlete, I just got an email, guys, the other day. It's heartwarming and beautiful. I'm an expecting father. Came into the crushed mailbox, crushed wow. comments. I'm an expecting father. Jeff, heard your comments, heard you, listened to you all the time. I uh, would just like to know, hey, what should I be thinking about? We're having a boy. They, 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 they know it's a boy coming. What do we need to know as parents to make sure – he just enjoys and, 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 and has a good time out there. What a beautiful email that was. And that's kind of what today's conversation is today. Just great stuff, guys.
Absolutely. I know Pete, I know, I know Jeff is talking about we can get anybody better. I mean, every brain we've seen, there have been a few anomalies here and there in our world because we track what we do really well. But uh, you want to be able to do it in a shorter period of time. You don't want to work more or work harder. It's not something that the brain actually enjoys. The brain enjoys faster pleasure in a shorter period of time. That's why drugs are so attractive to it. That's why it becomes addicted to the drugs. It gets its high much faster. And the faster you can get to that pleasure, the more the brain loves it. And you'll become addicted to that particular drug or in our case, exercise. If you want kids to really enjoy what's going on, get out of the way. Build in the exercise environment that stimulates and, and forces the brain to release some dopamine so that it is pleasurable. And that's, that'd be my last word. Just get out of the way and, and, and teach the brain how to release that dopamine. You know, and we are coming to the end. And guys, this has been awesome, man. You guys have been fantastic. Uh, you know, I was just thinking, it's just top of my head, Tim, because I remember when Moneyball first came out, one, you know, it had some good things and not some, not, not so good things. But also, it, at that time, they were talking about, we're going to go out and find players um, at younger levels that understand the strike zone because that can't be developed. Well, you can throw that out the window because it sounds like a strike zone can be learned by anybody. It can now, uh, but you will have to have implicit tools to do it. Mm -hmm. it, it, it. I don't care how many balls you see. I don't care if you turn the pitching machine up to 99 or 107. It's irrelevant because you're not affecting uh, what the, the spatial neurons that the information is traveling through. Therefore, when I see it, when I see a V-flex set of numbers, I can tell a V-Flex team simply because of their ball efficiency. You know, it's hard to tell anything from the strike world because you can still hit a, hit a line drive and make an out. But the, the true positive in all of this behavior for the strike zone, whether it's uh, early age or a, an adult or a pro baseball player, it's their brain's ability to desensitize to those borderline pitches that – make some millions of dollars, you know, because just the way it is. I mean, if you can understand uh, strike efficiency, ball efficiency, then you have a, you have a great resume if you're a baseball player. Absolutely. Uh, and Crush, to kind of close it off a little bit here, your younger coaches just getting started with young kids, some advice, where, where do they start? What's the most, I know you talked about some of the stuff, but let's, let's kind of, give them a, a good starting base to make sure they're doing certain things correctly. Yeah, I'll, I'll say this. I'll say this, Pete. The three simple letters, F-U-N. It's got to be fun. It's got to be fun at all levels. And you got to define fun, right? I've been, I've, been, yes. uh, I've, been caught, I've been caught by this a couple of times. <laughs> uh, I, you know, some of our pro guys, their definition of fun is very different <laughs> than my definition of fun. You know, if you're going to have fun in sport, it's just having success or embracing failure. You know, if a young athlete understands that they're getting better, um, that's fun, man. Getting better is fun. And it can be rewarding. Even the most brutal failures can be rewarding if we teach them how to learn from it. And again, that's an important skill for sure. And I guess if I were to say one other thing that I believe is, is critically important for the future of sport, play as many sports for as long as humanly possible multi-sport this early this early specialization uh, catastrophe that we're seeing is resulting in a lot of these these dropouts and a lot of that is due to burnout and and certainly overuse injuries so those would be my two biggest things and you know all of this stuff comes into play when we have a good good healthy system process in place and and i think the future is really bright this is these conversations are how we change the future of sport at the highest level and how we're going to raise the highest level by addressing youth development properly. So exciting times, guys. Absolutely. And Tim, lastly, where's this going when it comes to the brain? What's the next, I guess this is the frontier. What's, what, what's not looking, ahead of us? We're not looking for answers. We're looking for the next best question. That's where I am. I mean, I'm not, I'm not looking. I don't talk to people to find answers. I, the answers are few and far between. It's just how do you develop a hypothesis that can be tested? How can you ask a better question? You know, how can you, like 
the re one of the when I was in California with my Titleist uh, guys the other day, I spent three days. Uh, I spent 30 minutes with Titleist. I spent three days with my uh, Top Gun fighter pilot. You know, because we were asking questions about, you know, uh, the Northern Sea versus the Southern Sea. You know, how far did that radar wave go down into the water? What changed? How do you get rid of a heat-seeking missile? How do you, where's the, where is the thermocline that that missile can't find you? Which that tells me in, in the brain, when the brain's seeking a moving object, it's providing a specific type of information. What type of information is that? And how does the brain handle that information? And that's what I'm talking about. You just have to ask more intelligent questions. Find guys that ask great questions. You know, and that's something that's really, really, really rare in, in the sports world because everybody wants to tell you what they know. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, I'll tell you what, what, that's a good way to close it off. Um, I can't, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I think I'm going to have to go lay down for about an hour and, <laughs> and just take all this in. <laughs> and, I, and, and listen, this you're is the first You're a trooper, Pete. You're, you're a the trooper, first man. I swear first, you are. You're a well, good guy. Well, it's the first conversation. And then, like you said, I mean, we got we to gotta do a lot more of these talks. We're talking too much sometimes about the fundamentals. Um, we need to talk about the brain and how it works and, and everything that we've talked about today. And Crush, man, can't thank you enough. Uh, you guys are awesome. So much Jeff, fun. hey man, come on down to Tennessee sometime. Love to have you down here, boy. Hey man, he might be moving there. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, man. No kidding. I tell you what, hey, as soon as these uh, board, as soon as these borders are open, you can you can call me a house guest, Tim. I guarantee it. All right, I'm looking forward to it. Chris, thank you for coming in today. I I don't know you, but thanks for coming, man. All right, everybody, folks. That is Jeff Crochelle, Tim Nicely. This was a fantastic show. Special thank you to Brian Crock, our producer with the Lineup Media Group. Remember, it is the show that loves to interview baseball's best coaching minds who love to challenge the status quo. Hey, please, don't forget, all we ask, everything's free. We got over 80 shows on, on uh, YouTube. YouTube is Peter Caliendo, and all we ask is that you go to the YouTube channel and just hit the button subscribe, and that will help us tremendously get the show out. That is it. Folks, thank you in the U.S. and around the world for joining us. Thank you to Crush and, and Tim. You guys are awesome. God bless everybody. We'll see you on the next show. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Tim. Good to see you guys again.